Hello everyone, this is my lecture on chemiosmosis and oxidative phosphorylation. In the previous lectures we spoke about the composition of the electron transport chain and we also uh, discussed how the electrons actually move in this pathway through the electron transport chain ending up being donated to molecular oxygen to form water and we said that one of the, the outcomes of that electron transport uh, process was this proton gradient that is formed across the membrane which actually carries out the electron transport. And we're going to talk today about how this potential energy stored in this gradient is used to actually make ATP through a process called chemiosmosis and oxidative phosphorylation. So just to recap then, the citric acid cycle uh, oxidizes acetyl coenzyme A into two molecules of carbon dioxide while also capturing electrons in the form of three NADH molecules and one FADH and those of course are carried on to the electron transport chain and those electrons are so-called high energy electrons and they each uh, contain a, a or each of these coenzymes contain a pair of electrons with a high transfer potential. Those electrons are ultimately transferred through the electron transport chain onto oxygen to form water. So the process of electron transfer is coupled to transporting protons from, if we're talking about eukaryotes and we're talking about mitochondria, from the matrix of the mitochondria to the intermembrane space. If we were talking about prokaryotes, an example Escherichia coli, we would say that the electron transport chain takes place in the plasma membrane and so the transfer would be from the, uh, of the protons would be from the cytoplasm into that periplasmic space of E. coli. So the chemiosmotic theory then is that the oxidation of, of NADH and FADH in the mitochondrial matrix by the electron transport chain links the redox energy to ATP synthesis by oxidative phosphorylation through the establishment of a proton gradient across that inner membrane. And as the protons then flow down this gradient, it, it, it allows the ATP synthase, which is a, a protein complex to actually generate ATP. So proton transport generates an electrochemical gradient across the inner membrane, as we've said, uh, which of course simply means that there are more protons on the, on the outside than the inside of the matrix. So again, looking at the mitochondria, here are our three, uh, or I beg your pardon, our four electron transport chain complexes. And we said that at complex one, complex three, and complex four, we have transfer of protons from the matrix side into the intermembrane space. And so what the upshot of this will be is that there's simply quite a lot more protons in this intermembrane space than there is in the matrix. And that is the gradient. And we will define electrochemical gradient on the next slide. But what this gradient then allows is that it, is a, it stores a, a type of potential energy and the gradient wants to be allevi alleviated and it can only, this can only happen through the, the passage of the protons back through very specialized protein channels, uh, which are contained in the ATP synthase. And we will talk, we'll talk about this in, in much greater detail. So that inner membrane is impermeable to protons. That's what we said. We have the, uh, the, the, the protons now in the intermembrane space, but this membrane is impermeable to these protons, so they cannot simply flow back down the gradient. So the protons are forced through a very special proton channel that are, cu that are coupled with ATP synthase, or simply ATPase. So the electron transport chain forms the proton gradient. The protons want to travel back down the gradient, back to the inside of the mitochondrial matrix, but it can only do so through a very spe specified channel uh, which is contained in ATP synthase. And this electrochemical gradient produces a so-called proton motive force that moves the protons through the ATPase complex. Each time a proton comes through the ATPase complex, the free energy of the electrochemical gradient is slightly reduced, but that free energy is used to create ATP by phosphorylating ADP and releasing that ATP into the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, so the theory of chemiosmosis and oxidative phosphorylation. The coupling between oxidation and phosphorylation was actually a mystery for many years, and it was believed that substrate level phosphorylation is or was involved.
and, and this kind of makes sense um, towards the, the, the end of the 19th and, and beginning of the early part of the 20th century, glycolysis had been uh, fully described. Um, later in the, as we, we learned in the 1930s, the TCA cycle was uh, fully described almost at the level that we know it today. And in both of those, a, a ATP or a GTP is formed through substrate level phosphorylation. So it, it kind of made sense that what happened in the mitochondria must also be substrate level phosphorylation because that was what, what people knew about. So that meant that there had to be some sort of high energy intermediate. You'll remember that in, in glycolysis we had 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate uh, and phosphoenolpyruvate, which are high energy phosphorylated intermediates, which are used in this process of substrate level phosphorylation to create ATP from an ADP substrate. And people looked for this high energy intermediate in this process of ATP generation in the mitochondria. And uh, biochemists actually squandered careers searching for this elusive high energy intermediate, which we now know doesn't actually exist. Until in the early 1960s, a British biochemist called Peter Mitchell proposed a novel idea, which is that a proton gradient across the inner membrane created by the electron transport chain could be used to create, to drive ATP synthesis. Now, he coined this term chemiosmosis because, of course, it is an osmosis of, uh, of protons back across this membrane that allows the, that provides the energy for ATP generation. Now, at first, he was ridiculed for this idea because, to a large extent, it was mostly um, just worked out on paper. There was very few experimental, um, experimental proof for his ideas, and it took a long time for that proof to come. Um, and so, therefore, a long time for the theory to be accepted. But finally, the theory was proven and he won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1978. And at the end of this lecture, I'm going to show you one of the experiments that was done uh, to prove chemiosmosis. So, how does a proton gradient drive the synthesis of ATP? That's now our next question. And the movement of the ions across the uh, membrane actually depend on two factors. First, there's simply a diffusion force caused by a concentration gradient, right? So we have more particles on the one side of the membrane than we have on the other side of the membrane. And all particles, including ions, want to diffuse from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So that causes a diffusion force. But we also have an, um, an electrostatic force, which is caused by an electrical potential gradient. Um, and that is a consequence of the charge separation across the membrane. What we mean by that is because this is an ion, uh, the proton is, is an ion, a positively charged molecule, um, it means that in differentiating or causing this gradient across the membrane, it means that there are now more positive charges on the one side of the membrane than there are on the other. And that is an electrostatic force that that will also allow um, uh, molecules to flow down this kind of uh, electrostatic force and that means that both of those two gradients taken together is what we call the electrochemical gradient. So it includes both a diffusion aspect and an electrostatic aspect. So the lipid bilayers of biological membranes are of course barriers for ions and energy can be can therefore be stored in a combination of these two gradients across the membrane. And only a special type of membrane protein, uh, which contains a special type of channel, um, which is very selective just for protons, can allow those ions to move back across the membrane. So in the chemiosmotic theory, it is uh, transmembrane ATP synthases that convert the energy of the spontaneous flow of protons, which is caused by this proton motor force, um, through the ATP synthase, um, they then convert that into the chemical energy of an ATP bond. So they turn this stored electrochemical potential into the what is the energy currency of the cell, uh, namely ATP. So the term proton motor force is uh, derived from this, from this electrochemical gradient and it can be described as a measure of the potential energy stored as a combination of the proton gradient as well as the voltage gradient across a membrane. So differences in proton concentration and also the electrical potential differences. The proton motor force is then what drives ATP synthesis as the protons flow back from the intermembrane space into the matrix of the mitochondria.
The amount of energy that can be stored in this gradient can actually be calculated as a free energy difference for protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. And we are, this, this is one of the um, equations that are used to, to describe this, where this uh, delta G, of course, is the Gibbs free energy. And it is a function of the ratio of proton concentrations on the two sides of the membrane. So the C1 and the C2 um, actually represent the concentrations of the proton on either side of the membrane. Uh, the charge of the proton and the potential difference uh, across the membrane as well as Faraday's constant. Now we're not going to go into further detail about uh, using this, this equation but what I wanted to illustrate was that you can see that it is mostly dependent, it is almost entirely dependent on the concentration difference on the, the two sides of the membrane. So the concentration of protons on one side of the membrane is going to um, be much larger than on the other side, we're going to have a large delta G difference, so a large potential energy uh, difference available for the, uh, for the production of ATP. So then, just a brief summary at this point of, of uh, energy metabolism, the continual production of ATP is therefore dependent on the maintenance of a proton reservoir in the intermembrane space. The, this is dependent on the continued movement of electrons along the electron transport chain, which itself is dependent on the availability of oxygen. And we, because we need oxygen to enable the electron transport chain to continue, of course, oxygen needs to be there as the final electron acceptor. And we also need food to provide the sugars or fats or proteins that are actually um, turned into these, uh, well, from, from which high energy electrons are actually placed onto the coenzymes, which is of course what is fed into the electron transport chain. So energy metabolism is therefore harvesting of high energy electrons so that the high energy electrons can be fed into the electron transport chain. That leads to a, a um, proton concentration gradient across the membrane and it is as this uh, gradient is, is dissipated through the proton motor force uh, which has to happen through the ATP synthase uh, proton channels that ATP actually gets created. Okay, so to look in detail of, of, of uh, how this process happens, we have to now take a look at this massive protein complex called an ATP synthase. And there are remarkable similarities between ATP synthases from uh, prokaryotes and, and eukaryotes, although there are some differences, some of which I will show but um, they are drawn in, in many different ways in, in textbooks and in images that you might see. Um, they are sometimes shown as different sides up. What is important to remember is that um, it has a part that is embedded in the membrane and that of course is going to contain our proton channel and it has a part that is uh, embedded or, or that is free inside either the mitochondrial matrix in, in uh, if it's eukaryotes or of course inside the cytoplasm if it was a prokaryote. Okay, so let's have a look at some of this detail and uh, in terms of the structure and then we will have a look at how ATP is actually uh, synthesized. So proton diffusion through the ATP synthase is what drives ATP synthesis as we said and we, we look at the ATP synthase and we say that it's got basically got two parts and I said one part is embedded in the membrane and one part is in the mitochondrial matrix and we call those the F1 and F0 parts. And that why uh, that is why this uh, structure is also sometimes referred to as an F1, F0 ATPase. Uh, as I said, it appears in the inner mitochondrial membrane and it faces the matrix side. So the F1 part is what actually catalyzes the synthesis of uh, ATP from ADP. So this is the, the synthesis part of this complex specifically these beta subunits um, are involved in actually making ATP and all of the other subunits are basically there to support that function. The F0 part is uh, the transmembrane part of the protein complex and it contains the pore through which the protons are channeled. Now as I said there are many different types of these uh, ATP synthases looking at the, the yeast ATP synthase, it actually looks a little bit different from the E. coli one. Um, we have the F1 parts 
um, are actually named for Greek alphabet letters and the F0 part is named for English alphabet letters and you'll see they're always named in order of decreasing uh, protein size. One thing I want to show you over here is that they are also subclassed, uh, apart from being called F1 and F0, as either stator or rotor. And that should, uh, from the name, just give you a clue that some, part, some of these parts are stationary and some of them are rotary. And that is very important for the function of the ATP synthase. Okay, so now the F1 consists of five polypeptides, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. And those subunits are, as I said, named for Greek letters in orders of decreasing molecular weight. They are present with their stoichiometry, although this might differ for different organisms. Um, but the general stoichiometry is there are three of the alpha subunits, three of the beta subunits for each one of the gamma, delta, and epsilon. And you'll see the way that they are ordered. We have the alpha and beta subunits are homologous to each other, and they're also organized in a, uh, in a ring where we have alternative alpha and beta units. So you have a beta unit, you have an alpha unit, and if we look at it from the top, um, there are the six of them are actually spaced in this way, where it's an alpha, a beta, an alpha, and so on. Um, there are three nucleotide binding uh, catalytic sites located at A and B interfaces, but predominantly involving residues of the beta subunits. So there are binding sites for ATP and ADP on, um, on the, the beta subunits. The alpha subunits bind ATP, but they're actually not catalytic. So the alpha subunit contains a tightly bound ATP, but is actually inactive in catalysis. And it is the beta subunit that has um, either an ADP bound to it, or an ATP bound to it, or the other one is empty. So it's always in this way. It's one of them has an ADP, one of them has an ATP, and one of them is empty. But we will see um, when we talk about the actual ATP synthesis, how um, this is actually part of the function, as each of the beta subunits actually cycles through three different um, through each of the th or three different states, structural states, and that is the, the most important part of ATP synthesis. Magnesium also binds with the adenine nucleotides in both the alpha and beta subunits, and the gamma subunits um, form a shaft, and it is the shaft that connects the F0 and the F1 uh, part. Specifically, it connects the rotary part of the complex structure to, um, to the alpha and beta subunits. So if we look at the F0 subunits, they're named A, B, C, and sometimes D and E in different organisms, and also that goes with decreasing molecular weight. So the stoichiometry of these subunits are a little bit different. Um, they normally have uh, an, a 1A, in, in the case of E. coli, it's 1A subunit, 2B subunits, and then 10 to 12 C subunits in yeast, we saw that it could be 15 or more, and um, this is very important when, when we talk about the function of this complex and because it actually plays a big role in how much um, ATP can be synthesized from the same strength of, uh, of, of protein, proton gradient. Those C subunits form a ring which acts as the rotor, so this is a very important part to have a look at now. This C subunits, these 12 of them, um, as they're illustrated over here, they form this ring and they are actually going to be um, the most important part in terms of the, the rotary motion of, um, of the ATPase. The A and B subunits form a starter, uh, a stationary part. Um, the A subunits is what actually contains the proton channels and um, it is connected with the B subunits to these um, alpha and beta subunits of the F1 part, and these are all actually stationary. So the C, the uh, gamma, and the epsilon are the actual um, rotary parts. Okay, so ATP synthase is a rotating molecular motor. The C, gamma, and epsilon constitute the actual uh, rotating portion, um, the, the, the rotor of, of this molecular motor. And the B, D, and H subunits form a long slender stalk that connects the F1 and uh, the F0. And it's the flow of protons through 
the uh, C subunits that turn the rotor and drives the cycle of conformational changes in the alpha and beta subunits that actually cause ATP to be synthesized. Okay, so um, the proton flow through F0 actually drives the rotation of the motor and synthesis of ATP. Now, it's a little bit uh, difficult to understand what I'm going to say now on uh, just with this uh, static image. And I would recommend that you watch some of the videos that the one I've linked over here, but also the one uh, I will also put that in that link in the description of how this rotary motion actually comes about. Uh, it'll give you a much clearer understanding than what I can uh, I can do without the animation here. So the way that this works is that protons enters the an inlet half channel on an A on the A subunit, and that is then transferred onto the C subunit. So a proton enters through the A subunit, but it is not a channel that runs right through to the inner side. Okay, so this is E. coli, which is why this is called periplasma or cytoplasm. If it was um, a, a, a eukaryotic, if it was a, a, a mitochondria, this would have been the intermembrane space and uh, the matrix of, of the mitochondria. So protons are actually carried inside a, a inlet half channel. And what that means is the proton comes into this A subunit and it is transferred onto a C subunit. The rotation, this causes a conformational change which leads to a, a movement of, um, of the C subunits. And remember they are organized in this circle and that means the whole thing rotates slightly. So as protons then flow through, the st entire structure starts to turn and that drives a cycle of conformational changes in all the other, proton, uh, all the other proteins. So the proton comes into the half inlet channel on, on uh, subunit A. It binds to a, um, to a subunit C. That causes a, rot a rotation to start. More protons comes in, uh, the next proton lands on its subunit C and the rotation continues. And it, goes, it keeps going that way until you've completed one complete circular motion. Now, remember I said that it depends on uh, the amount of C subunits, how many actual pr uh, protons it takes in order to cause this rotation to happen one time. If it was a, a C10 arrangement, which means that there are 10 C subunits, it would have taken 10 protons to come into this A inlet half channel and bind to the, um, the 10 C subunits one after the other to cause one complete rotation. When the rotation is complete, the, uh, the proton actually can enter the outlet channel of the A subunit and that'll allow that proton to then enter the cytoplasm, in this case, or mitochondrial matrix, um, if it was on a uh, mitochondria. And um, then there is now space for a new proton to come in and bind to a C subunit. Okay, so the movement of protons through this F0 channel then causes the gamma subunit to rotate. So just to go back, this entire um, C, all these C subunits are going to rotate. Attached to that is the gamma subunit and depending on different organisms, delta and epsilon. And that entire thing will now rotate along with the C subunits. And that um, that rotation actually drives conformational changes to the structure of the beta subunits resulting in the binding of ADP and or inorganic phosphate and they will eventually be released as the product ATP. So it is the rotation which is started by the C units is carried by these um, gamma delta epsilon units uh, forward and that causes all of that rotation causes conformational changes of the alpha and beta subunits. And it's specifically the important part is the conformational changes of the beta subunits, as that is what is going to be uh, the, the catalytic site for the production of, of ATP. So that, that's what we're illustrating here with this little animation, as uh, this doesn't unfortunately show the protons coming in and binding to the, uh, the C subunits. But these, this part over here would be the C subunits bound to each other. And as you can see, that uh, rotates and that causes the, the um, gamma and epsilon um, subunits to also rotate. 
And even though the alpha and beta subunits don't rotate, this rotation causes conformational changes in those proteins. And it is cycling through these different states. And as I said a little bit earlier, there are three different conformational states. Um, it's cycling through these different states that allows the subunit to bind to its substrates, to, which is ADP and phosphate, um, to create ATP and then to release ATP again in, in the third conformation. And that is actually the next part um, that we're going to talk about, which is it's called the binding change mechanism of ATP synthesis. Um, described by a, a man called Paul Boyer, it basically describes the events that happens uh, in this rotational catalysis. So he proposed that at any instant, the this three beta subunits of F1 exist in one of three conformations. And these different states actually represent the three steps of ATP synthesis. And each uh, site steps through all three conformations to make ATP. So it's not as if one beta unit is always in one type of conformation and the others all in, in, in a different one. All three uh, of the, the, the beta subunits will, as the rotation continues, step through these three different conformational states. So in Paul Boyer's binding change mechanism, the three catalytic sites thus cycle through the three intermediate states and that allows ATP synthesis to happen. So the beta subunits catalyze the synthesis of ATP from ADP and, and phosphate. Each subunit has one catalytic site for ATP synthesis, and each subunit can be in one of three conformations. It can be either in this open conformation, as it is illustrated over here, and that has very low affinity for substrates and products, so nothing really binds to that. And that is important because after ATP gets synthesized, it cycles to this um, conformation, and that actually allows ATP to be released. We have the loose conformation, and that has, um, that has affinity for ADP and phosphate. So that is the conformation in which the substrates can actually bind. And then we have the tight conformation, which binds to ligands very tightly, and that, this is the catalytic, uh, catalytically active conformation. So this is where ADP actually gets phosphorylated to ATP. Okay, so let's learn, look at the mechanism. ADP and, and, and phosphate binds to this loose site, the L site. So if we look at the three different, for, for simplicity, it's just the, uh, the beta subunits that are um, illustrated over here. And we will see as you go through this um, process, this represents a further rotation so that uh, we actually can allow conformational changes of the three different beta subunits. So you'll, if you just look at this pink one, it'll cycle from open to loose to tight. Um, and each of them will, will basically uh, go through these three different conformations as the rotation carries on. So let's start with this site over here, which is in the loose um, conformation. ADP and phosphate can now bind in this uh, loose conformation, uh, which we will call for simplicity the L site. Uh, protons now flow through the F0 channel that turns the, uh, turns the, the, the gamma subunit and that drives the that rotation drives the conformational change of the beta subunits. And so what happens is that the, the subunit which was in the loose conformation now goes to the tight conformation, which is illustrated over there. The one that was in the tight conformation will go to the open conformation, and the one that was in the open conformation will now, um, will now go to the loose conformation. So... Um, In the new uh, tight site, the new T site, which is what is formed over here, if we, we remember, we said in the first one, um, the ADP and phosphate is now bound. Uh, the conformational change happens to, uh, to the, the, the tight conformation, and we actually get the phosphorylation of ADP so that ATP can form. And with one further turn of the gamma subunit, the T site now becomes the O site, the open site. And that actually allows ATP to be released, and a new ADP and phosphate can bind to a new L site. And so the cycle continues. So as long as protons can flow through the ATP synthase um, F0 part, the rotation can continue. And as long as the rotation can continue and there is a substrate available, the ADP and the phosphate 
um, ATP can continually be synthesized. So that then basically the binding change mechanism of ATP synthesis. So um, earlier I said that there was an experiment that was done to actually prove that this is the way that um, ATP gets produced. And uh, this is just in very broad strokes. Uh, the, the experiment, which was done many years after uh, Peter Mitchell um, actually described his experiment. And what the scientists uh, did was they reconstituted a, a synthetic vesicle. Uh, so they, they made a synthetic uh, lipid bilayer and they isolated a ATP synthase, a complete ATP synthase, and they basically made a lipid bilayer little vesicle which contains an ATP synthase and a protein called a bacterial rhodopsin. Now what is special about this bacterial rhodopsin protein is that when you shine light on it, it'll transfer protons across, uh, across this protein. So it allows protons to go from the one side of a membrane to the other. So no light, no proton transfer. As soon as you switch on the light, you will see uh, protons being transferred. And what they then saw was that as long as they had ADP and phosphate available, once you turn the light on uh, and proton transfer could happen, that the ATP synthase on its own could actually produce ATP. And that was seen as a, a proof of the uh, chemiosmosis theory. So this is, I'm going to end this lecture here in the, the last part, uh, the last lecture on um, electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to look at some of the inhibitors of oxidative uh, phosphorylation. Um, and there's also the question of why certain organisms actually produce more ATP from the same amount of substrate than others.